Welcome to Life and Faith. This is Justine Toe from the Centre for Public Christianity. Well, I wonder if you remember the eternity sign that lit up Sydney's Harbour Bridge at the turn of the millennium. That word had actually been scrawled on Sydney footpaths for years by a guy called Arthur Stace, who went on to become one of Sydney's most colourful characters. Well, the story of Arthur Stace is entwined with that of Hammond Care. That's one of Australia's biggest charities that today specialises in aged care and particularly the care of people with dementia. So today I'm very pleased to have on the program Meredith Lake. Meredith, welcome. Thank you. Uh, she's an historian who dived into Hammond Care's archives. As, as I heard you say before, they you were handed the key literally um, because to the archives so you could piece together the story of the organisation that you tell in the book Faith in Action. What was that like? How did that feel to be handed the keys to the kingdom in a sense? You know? <laughs> Oh, it was, it was a wonderful opportunity, really. I was asked to go snooping around, if you like, uh, without much idea of what I was going to find. I think the CEO of Hammond Care and their chairman at the time knew that there was a great story or several great stories uh, lurking in those archives, uh, but I had no idea what was ahead of me. And so it was a great privilege, actually, to go and you know read other people's mail and you know trawl back through those dusty old documents and and. I guess, encounter some really wonderful characters and some amazing things that they did to benefit the needy people of Sydney and New South Wales. How about we start with um, talking about Arthur Stace then? Because, I mean, I didn't know this. I thought he was only like the eternity guy, Mr Eternity. But he was also a charity worker and it all actually started with his connection with Hammond Care. So can you fill in the blanks for us? So Stace was already in his 40s. Uh, by the time of the Great Depression, the 1930s Depression, and he'd had a pretty rough run. Uh, he'd grown up in a in a very um, alcoholic household, um, never really landed uh, secure work or been able to hold a job for long, and with very little education and ended up living a very marginal kind of existence, quite illegal in many of his activities and quite... Um, he'd been, he was often quite sick because he had such a low quality of life as well as illicit interests. And he was in his mid-40s when the Depression hit uh, and he was a very vulnerable man. And he wandered into St Barnabas Broadway where Hammond was the minister. Uh, One Wednesday night there was a men's meeting on and as he later said, you know, he went in looking for a cup of tea and a rock cake and came out having met the Rock of Ages. He had a conversion experience under Hammond's ministry and gave up the grog on the spot and then became one of Hammond's most kind of useful and trusted um, colleagues. He he became the the leader, if you like, of a hostel in inner Sydney for destitute men, where you could you know shave and shine your shoes before braving the big bad world again. And yeah, Stace made a great contribution as I guess a kind of pastor almost, or a friend really to people who are down and out. And that idea of being a friend also to people who are down and out that is very much the story of Robert Hammond. Is that right? Can, how about we? like turn our gaze on him you know he he as you write in the book became known as a mender of broken men it's quite incredible tell us more about him he was a, he was an incredible man uh, he'd um, grown up in a huge family actually with a Scottish mother and he was a big tall guy uh, a really good AFL footballer actually and uh, he had a, a big thick Scottish voice and he just really liked other men. I don't know if that's how people normally think of a Christian minister, but he was a blokey bloke and, you know, enjoyed a bit of rough and tumble. He was the kind of minister who was more often out in the streets, in people's houses, standing on a box, preaching on a street corner than, you know, in his own pulpit or drinking tea with the ladies committee. Um, he, he liked uh, working class men and spent a lot of time with them. And that was true right through the early decades of the 20th century. By the time we get to the Depression, he's already running soup kitchens, an employment bureau, um, a place where you can get some donated furniture or clothes. He's already doing all of that. He's already in his 60s, actually, um, by the time the crisis of the Depression hits. Um, so he was well-placed to help people. And was he having... He had hostels at the same time as all that that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's pretty incredible. A whole series of facilities across the inner city for families or particularly for single unemployed men, um, somewhere to stay. This is a time when... Uh, there, there is no kind of regular dole in the way we might think about it. The, there's no welfare safety net uh, like we have now, even though there are holes, obviously, now. There was nothing much uh, then. And so if you needed a hand, you had to turn, turn to the churches uh, or some kindly soul. Well, this is where the story gets really interesting because you write that he actually 
Robert Hammond cashed his life savings, I guess the equivalent of today's superannuation, when he was in his 60s. And then he used that money to buy a plot of land upon which he built all these cottages for people, right, who who, who, who were um, suffering because of the Depression. Maybe they couldn't find work or they'd been evicted. It's an incredible act of generosity, cashing his life insurance like that. Uh, He didn't have any surviving children, um, which may have, I don't know if that factored in his thinking, Um, no descendants to provide for. But he was an impulsively generous person, um, which I think is what's so compelling about him, although you know, his wife paid a bit of a price uh, yeah, sure too. She, uh, she would have suffered under that, I'm sure. Yeah. But buying a, a, a tract of land, which, I mean, this is when Heathcote Road, which runs um, from southwest from Liverpool, really was just a dirt track. It was the middle of nowhere. They had to cut down the trees uh, to build these wooden cottages. It was some of the first residents who moved in there. They'd been homeless, literally, in Sydney and wound up with a cottage. Uh, but some of them were pretty stressed out at being in the middle of nowhere, you know, five muddy kilometres from Liverpool. Uh, but it, it put a roof over people's heads, gave... Uh, destitute children another chance at life and I mean really it was one of the most successful land settlement schemes one of the most effective responses to the challenges of the depression that uh, anywhere in Australia. Well, we've got a clip actually from 1933 of Robert Hammond talking about what became known as the Pioneer Homes Scheme. Let's have a listen. The shelter of homeless families of whom there are nearly 5,000 in Sydney now is the most acute problem that we are called upon to face. This is one of the model pioneer homes of which 14 have already been built in Liverpool, made possible by the generosity of many friends and the voluntary labour of unemployed men. In brief, the idea of the pioneer home settlement is that unemployed and homeless families may obtain a three-roomed house with a sleep-out veranda 30 feet by 6 foot 6 and an acre of land for only 5 shillings a week. As only families with children are accepted, this 5 shillings a week is paid from child endowment. That amount of money is more than counterbalanced by the vegetables, fruit and poultry which can be raised on the land. And at the end of seven years, there will be no more payments and the pioneer home builders will own their own homes in healthy surroundings. So we've heard Hammond talking about the possibility of having a healthy life in in these rural surroundings. What was life like at Hammondville? You've got all these news reports where... um, People who were children at the time have now grown up and they're, and they're old and they've got such fond memories of the place. Was it like that? I think for many of the children, uh, it was a Huckleberry Finn kind of existence. Uh, they played in the bush quite freely, swam in the Georges River back when it was pure and pristine. And I think for the children, it, it was an amazing place to grow up. And you're right, the people who are now in their 80s reflect on it with very great fondness and delight, really. Part of the, what was great about it is many of them didn't realise just how poor they were. Um, their parents had had a really rough trot. Many of their parents had been veterans of the First World War, had a very tough adulthood and then wound up on the wrong side of the Depression with no job and no home to live in. Uh, but for the children, it really was a fresh chance and some of the people who grew up in Hammondville have gone on to all kinds of amazing things. Jim Masterton of Masterton Homes, his dad was given a place at Hammondville and became one of the first shopkeepers. And now, you know, how many people has Jim Masterton given a home to in one way or another? Um, John Hatton became uh, the anti-corruption campaigner in the New South Wales uh, Legislative Assembly and quite an extraordinary career. And, and many other people, there was a Commonwealth Games cyclist, all kinds of wonderful uh, achievements mainly because somebody gave those kids another chance in the thick of a very great crisis. Yeah, I've got a quote here. Um, You mentioned John Hatton. Um, So he instigated this anti-corruption investigation. And then you write, later he traced his commitment to honesty and independence to his childhood experiences at Hammondville. So that's incredible. It's it's an incredible statement of the investment in this this person's life. And then he's gone on to to do, as you said, such, such great things in that area. So we have um, Canon Hammond who cashes his life savings and then basically makes available all these homes for people to rent at minimal cost in some ways. And the idea was that after seven years they would fully own the, um, their, their land and, sorry, their house. Um, of course, by it actually took longer than seven years. It was 1959, I believe, that 110 families all owned their own home, which still is a, is a really in, in, an incredible thing to consider when they would virtually destitute and homeless before then. Do you think, Meredith, that what Robert Hammond did back then would be possible today to give people that sort of chance to have their own independence? I mean, it's a great question. It's one I think 
the churches, the governments, regular citizens need to be grappling with because there's still great need of all different kinds in our community today. Uh, but the world is quite different too. Hammond lived at a time when being a maverick do-gooder was all you needed to be. A big, a big idea and a big heart and off you go. There was no government regulation. There was no red tape. You could just buy a block of land and ask people who wanted to live there, set them up. There, yeah. that, that's not the world we live in now. In many ways, we do need more people and more organisations with some of Har Hammond's characteristics, with boldness, with a preparedness to innovate. And I think the kind of radical, costly generosity, which for Hammond sprang from his own understanding of the good news about Jesus, that radical generosity that put himself in last place and the needs of other people first, um, in very practical ways, that's the kind of spirit I think will only ever enrich the community and help people in need. And the more of it, the better. At this point, it's worth uh, mentioning the words that you quote of um, Anglican Archbishop Howard Mole, who talked about Hammond. He said of Hammond, his religion was not a matter of painted windows, but of bound up hearts and reconstructed lives. And so there's this real tribute paid to the practical Christianity of this man. How about we move on to the post-war period, right? Because um, well, first we'll play this clip from the late 1950s, where at this stage, Hammond's Pioneer Homes has actually branched out to providing uh, homes for the elderly. At Hammondville, old couples have found comfort, independence and contentment in the even tide of life. Freed from the haunting dread of separation after a lifetime together, these and many other aged folk have found in the peaceful rural setting of Hammondville security, happiness and a new confidence. Their days are occupied by knitting and reminiscing as old people do. At Hammondville are many aged folk from both city and country who need nursing and medical attention. I'm struck by my own naivety. <laughs> I didn't know that there weren't specific provisions for the elderly um, for aged care, let's say, in the 1950s. Like, there was nothing like we have today. That, that, that whole sector, it, it seems, was um, purely the domain of charities that operated without government support. So you've got Hammond now um, working to provide people with homes, um, aged, aged people. What kind of difference did that make to people's lives? Well, so governments in Australia were world leaders, really, in providing a pension uh, for older people. Uh, one of the first nations in the world to have a pension, but accommodation for the aged. You're right, that as a sector really hadn't been invented until the post-war period, and it was Christian charities who blazed that trail. And it wasn't until Menzies in the mid-1950s kind of decided to throw a lot of government money at it, uh, because it's a very expensive business putting a roof over people's heads, and the number of the aged obviously is only ever increasing. It wasn't until Menzies made that step that we got what we now would recognise as an aged care and accommodation sector, which is you know, a massive chunk of the health and social service kind of spending. Hammond Care is known for its efforts in dementia care. And, and in the book, you, you tell the story of a woman who refused to be showered by anyone, but because of the approach that Hammond Care has in terms of its care for, um, for people with dementia, they ended up getting around that. Can you tell the story in your own words? Well, I think one of the amazing things about Hammond Care, and it's in the spirit of Hammond, is actually caring for the whole person. They're not just an unfortunate who lost their job or who's on the street. They're not just someone with dementia. They're a person with um, real needs, who, who's deserving of love and attention and care and respect. And that's a conviction that, again, stems from the Christian beliefs underlying all this, um, that leads to all kinds of creative ways of caring for people. And yeah, it's a remarkable story. They had a woman who, as she got older, uh, descended into dementia. Um, her husband, who was elderly himself, could no longer care for her at home, but he'd never invaded the privacy of her morning shower and getting dressed. She'd just come downstairs every morning and they'd ha then have breakfast together. And as she, he was no longer able to care for her, he moved her into one of Hammond Care's facilities for people with dementia. And they just let her continue caring for herself in that way until she became incontinent and needed more intervention. Uh, but she'd never had the privacy of her morning shower invaded, not even by her husband of many, many years, and reacted in a very stressed out way to having someone attempt to undress her and shower her. There's nothing in the textbook about how to deal with a situation like that. And it was actually one of um, their own care, direct care staff, not the director of nursing, not the CEO or someone with experience in all this, but someone who used to be a hairdresser and now enjoyed working with old people who realised that you could just 
you know, give the woman a massage with water and accidentally wet her feet. You know, take off her shoes and socks. Massage her legs with water. Oops, you've wet her skirt. Take off the skirt and, and shower her there. And work all the way up her body until she'd been cleansed and cared for in a really gentle and loving way. Well, it's an incredible story, Meredith, and thank you so much for taking time to share it with us. The book is Faith in Action, available in bookstores now.